Hello, everybody on YouTube. Welcome to the Writer's House. <laughs> uh, my name is Jamie Lee Jocelyn, and I am coming to you from South Philadelphia today. And I am so happy and so excited to be welcoming back to the Writer's House, uh, Catherine Hill, a friend of mine, a fellow alum of the Bennington Writing Seminars, uh, and the author of several books, including this one, A Short Move, which is just out this year. And this is the, the book we will be talking about and hearing from today. Catherine, welcome back. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jamie Lee. Of course. It's so great um, to be here, having been on the Penn staff for such a long time um, and having attended so many awesome Writers House events as an enthusiastic audience member. So I'm really thrilled to be able to be in conversation with you here today. I'm so excited. And I think um, we did an event with some, some Bennington pals of ours at the Writers House back in, I think, I think April of 2012. Yeah. So just just a couple minutes ago yeah. uh, <laughs> and uh so it's it's fantastic to have you back um just so everybody knows out there um i have worked at the writer's house for a long time in a number of capacities i uh am now and have been for a while teaching in the creative writing program and uh, most relevantly i am currently teaching a class called sports narratives which uh, is a lot of fun and maybe there's some sports narratives students and alumni uh, in our YouTube world right now watching. Hello friends, uh, if you're out there. And um, Catherine will also be joining my class later this afternoon. So I am grateful for that as well. Um, and Catherine, um, I'm wondering, well, first you mentioned, yes, that you used to live in Philadelphia and work at Penn and now you are living in Brooklyn. Um, what was, what years were you here in Philly? It was 2006 to 2012. Um, so actually probably right after that event that we did um, at the writer's house is that, that summer that I left, went to Cambridge, uh, so Boston area for one year mm -hmm. uh, before making my way back to the mid-Atlantic. That, that rings a bell. And I was also thinking about that because Cambridge comes up in the book and I was like, did she live in Cambridge? Not that you need to have lived in Cambridge in order to write about it, but I was, I was wondering. Um, and I guess maybe 2012 was your last year in Philly because you did the event at the writer's house. So then you accomplished <laughs> the you needed to. Check. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm, <laughs> I'm good. Um, and what was, um, what was the timeline for writing this book? So actually, I think I had basically already started it at the time that I left Philly. Um, my first book was published in 2013. Oh, no, wait, I moved in. I moved in. Yeah, 2012. My first book was published in the summer of 2013 and was kind of in production already when I left Philly the year before. Um, so I wrote that book almost entirely in Philadelphia, that first novel uh, called The Violet Hour. And then probably towards the end of the writing process for that book, I was working on a short story. Um, that was about a, a young woman who drops out of college and works in a retail, um, uh, works in, you know, retail clothing, basically a J. Crew type store. And her father in that story um, was a retired NFL player. He was really a minor character, um, a really significant uh, figure in her life, but a very, um, he existed at a great distance in her life at that moment in the story and it was something she was grappling with. Um, and when I finished the piece, I published it, the editor asked me, um, you know, is this part of something larger? I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of, it was a very innocent question, but it got me thinking. Um, and I realized I was actually quite interested in, in that family and particularly in the father who in the short story that I had, that I had just written was, you know, in his late thirties, maybe early forties and already an old man. And that was something that was just really um, striking to me. And I wanted to explore it further. I wanted to figure out um, how he got through a very accelerated youth and adulthood to the, an, an, old, an old man phase um, in what most of us would consider to be the, the prime of life. So I wrote another piece about him um, that was centered on uh, his teenage years, basically around the same age as his daughter had been in the previous story. And then between those two uh, little poles, I felt I had, I had a line that I could start um, extending in both directions. And I built the novel out from that. 
That is extremely interesting. I did not know that. And I'm like, it's all coming together for me right now <laughs> in a way that I uh, didn't expect. But I, uh, so the, for people who haven't gotten to read the book yet, I'll just say that, that that initial short story, first of all, you don't mention the name J. Crew. And I was reading it and I was like, this is J. Crew. Because <laughs> uh, I, I know those cardigans very mm -hmm. well. And this is actually not, a, I know you're wondering, this is not a J. Crew cardigan today, but there are many upstairs yeah. here. <laughs> and, um, but that's really interesting because that chapter, um, the book, again, for those who are, who are new to this book, um, it is a multi-perspective -pers book. So each chapter is told, um, it's all, well, mostly an omniscient narrator and, um, each chapter kind of goes between Mitch, the, the protagonist who's the football player, but the chapter we're talking about that primarily takes place at J. Crew uh, <laughs> is his daughter, Alyssa, but it comes uh, in the second half of the book. So it's really uh, interesting to me to, to think of that as, as your starting point and building it out from there. Yeah, um, totally. Yeah. That really surprised me too. I, I think probably <laughs> I needed, you know, a young female um, voice to get me to a place where I could confidently write about a football player who is an experience, you know, has would have had an experience and a life that's so radically different from my own. Um, but to meet him as a minor character in a story narrated by a younger woman um, was a helpful bridge for sure. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's really interesting. Um, all right. Well, I have a million more questions, but before I get too carried away with those, why don't we hear a little bit from the book yeah. and if you have an excerpt ready. Yeah, that sounds great. So I'm gonna read from the very beginning. Um, and this novel is, I call it a life narrative, um, meaning, which is sort of borrowing a nonfiction term, really. Um, I'm a mad, it, this is a fictional story. The characters are all inventions of mine, um, but the, the book really tracks the life of this one protagonist, Mitch Wilkins, a linebacker. Um, from birth basically, to, well, before birth to after death. So um, there's sort of a longitudinal quality to the novel. Um, and the best way I think to start a long novel or to read from a long novel is often just to give you the beginning, uh, the setup. So I don't have to explain too much. Uh, the novel is called A Short Move. The main character is Mitch Wilkins, a linebacker. And this is chapter one. Um, and each chapter is titled for the person who is the protagonist or the kind of focalizing narrator uh, our focalizing perspective and the year. So this is chapter one, Joe, 1971. Eight months before the legendary linebacker Mitch Wilkins was born, his father Joe stood at the edge of the Briarwood College pasture, gazing at a huddle of black and white cows. Joe had left his jacket at his girlfriend Cindy's and he was cold, though apparently the cows, those living radiators, were not. Even from his distance, he thought he could see the heat rising from their backs. He whistled a little, trying to get their attention. When the right one looked at him, say the near one in perfect silhouette, he'd go to Cindy, explain about the ring and ask her if she'd have him anyway. He didn't know what he'd do if one of the other cows looked, the ones with their bony butts to him or the ones already kind of facing his way. Try again, maybe with a different cow. He whistled again, louder this time. And the next thing he knew, the cows were all stock still but in slightly different positions, a head here, a belly there. He registered some noses and above each a pair of big bored eyes. And yet it was impossible to, see, to say if any of these faces belonged to his original cow. He would blacked out, missed the crucial shift. Perhaps he'd even missed it twice. And with this realization, he found himself seized with panic. He was 19 and staring at cows. He had no jacket, no engagement ring and no idea how he'd messed up so bad. Part of him wanted to blame his brothers. Rob, the oldest, with the chin scar and the hippo hands. Tim, the veiny one, younger by a year, shorter by an inch, and true to all lazy assumptions, more pugnacious by a mile. They'd always been a trio with him, the Wild Williams boys. But then, out of nowhere, the older two broke ranks, voluntarily deploying to Vietnam when Joe was still in high school. Everything fell apart after that. His dad seemed to be drunk more often, even in the mornings, and his mom slowed down, then simply stopped cleaning the house. Next thing Joe knew, she had breast cancer and a forecast of six months to live. He coped by throwing himself into his final season of Monacan County High School football and Monacan County high school parties. 
His dad coped by trying to get Joe a college scholarship, a scheme that involved a lot of beer, a lot of loud beer battered phone calls and one sideline chat with a suit wearing scout whose gospel Joe actually allowed himself to believe. In the end, despite a solid senior season, Joe graduated with zero scholarship offers. Then his mom died, leaving him all alone with an increasingly belligerent dad and no brothers around to tell him what to do. He really could have used them in his present situation, especially Robbie who didn't get mad like Tim. The present situation was that Cindy was pregnant. Cindy, who was so new to Joe, she'd never even met his mom and so studious and respectable, she'd barely met his friends, though they'd all gone to the same school together all their lives. And she'd even played volleyball, walking the halls in her shorts and high socks. He'd noticed her then. How could he not notice an extravagantly tall and pigtailed creature like Cindy Wilkins? But he'd been too hamstrung by stereotypes. She was a good girl. He was a degenerate, that he mostly pretended to ignore her. All that went out the window after his mom died, and he was feeling raw and open to anything, especially to women who seemed healthy and good. And it was in this frame of mind that he ran into Cindy at a bonfire, and she turned out to be exactly his type, confident in herself and surprisingly eager to fool around. Just like that, she forced him to reevaluate his understanding of goodness, and by extension, his understanding of himself. Maybe he didn't have to be a degenerate. Maybe he could be his own type. But then came her pregnancy, and with it, another reevaluation. You're gonna run now, she said, aren't you? Stung, he promised to marry her that very night, while she, in all her decency, tried to talk him out of it, saying, don't be hasty, marriage isn't a game. I'm not telling you to pressure you. Maybe you're not done being wild. But what the hell else was he supposed to do with such serious information? He rushed home, which was by now a genuine junk box of a living situation, cluttered with his old man's empty beer bottles and half-eaten containers of food, not to mention towers of unread newspapers, used tissues, and suspiciously smeared man briefs to claim the one thing his mother had left him, her engagement ring. His dad was in his usual spot, passed out on the couch, which gave Joe a clear lane to the stairs. What wasn't choked with dust was sticky and crawling with fruit flies, and the entire house smelled tuberish, a mixture of exfoliated skin and fart and the sour tang of day's old booze. But amid the master bedroom mess, his mom's ring was still there in its faded velvet box. Gold band, diamond crown, a tiny piece of indestructibility. He held it in his hand and thought maybe everything would be all right. It was a short-lived happiness because the next thing he knew, his father was awake and before him, already ranting, demanding to know what the hell was going on. In recent months, he'd been harder on Joe than ever, though Joe had never shown more direction, hauling peat, planting shrubs, clearing branches, and generally disposing of the natural debris, debris that menaced the prim grounds of Briarwood College, where his dad ran the physical plant. He loved the sweat, the muscle groups firing, the little kid thrill of sticking his hands into dirt, and he loved bringing home milk from the dairy. What he didn't love was coming home to his father, who devoted his downtime to heavy drinking, ruthless criticism, and goading Joe into useless fights. The old man was spry for a congenital alcoholic, could get a good grip, every now and then wriggle out of a hold. But Joe's reflexes were sharper, his balance better, his brain not made of mush. He pinned his father every time, lightly held him down, kicking and yelling until the old man just ran out of gas which was exactly what happened again that night when he came upstairs to find Joe taking priceless things without asking. Except this time, Joe was so buzzed on his sudden new future, so certain the ring was rightfully his, and so finally fed up with his father's distortions, the catastrophe of his inflated belly, the aftershock of his bloodshot eyes, his empty speechifying and his human smell, all the beers he drank while his wife lay dying, all the petty and regular ways he had of making Joe feel stupid and small, that he might have overdone it, thrown a real punch or two, and finished off with some personal accusations that reduced the old man to tears. And to top it off, after Joe finally disentangled himself and got the hell out of that miserable house, he discovered, driving in darkness back to Cindy's, digging into his pocket with one hand, the other loosely guiding the wheel, that he hadn't even managed to hold on to the ring. That he'd sought it and fought for it and won it, but then he'd lost it, slipped from his hand in a scuffle maybe, or dropped in the grass on the long way out. Come on, he called to the college pasture, where he'd finally pulled over around 1 a.m., too disgusted with himself to face Cindy just yet, and where he'd awoken that morning in his car, his neck bent almost to his chest, his body rigid from trying to clench in his heat. He leaned into the fence post, desperate for a decision. The one on the middle left in perfect profile, that was his new magic cow. He knew he ought to quit playing and just go to Cindy, what did she care about the ring? He'd buy her a better one later. And while he saved up for it, they could live with her parents, 
a sort of helpless but honorable pair. Mrs. Wilkins on disability from arthritis, Mr. Wilkins without an arm from World War II. It wouldn't be so bad. Her bedroom even had a private entrance. But the problem he was beginning to understand was bigger than the ring. Say he married her and they had a son. Say he spent every day in a tidy house teaching that kid how to treat people. Didn't even make him play football, but didn't stop him either if that's what the kid wanted to do. Say his brothers came home and raised families of their own. And in the meantime, Joe completely turned himself around, got a million degrees and became a doctor or something. Even then there'd be blind spots, gaps in coverage, things he plainly couldn't control. And whatever his situation, he'd still be himself, the degenerate son of his own failed father. Try as he might, he couldn't reason his way out of that one. A cow was approaching him now with surprising velocity, like a time-lapse film of the cow's whole day. She stood before him, a woolly tank with a nose like a giant rubber pad and ears that fired straight from her head. Finally, it was almost uncanny after all that time she'd spent standing around. He placed a hand on her neck and she tolerated it, even seemed to authorize a transfer of warmth. In that moment of weird skin-to-skin -skin contact, he had a memory of being a kid on his dad's shoulders, back when his dad was muscular and fast. Together, they were the Monacan maniac, the strongest man that ever lived. They tore through the yard like that, stalking Joe's terrorized brothers, especially Tim, the spiteful middle one, who always made a point of pinning Joe. He remembered his legs hugging his father's neck, his father's hands cupping his ankles, so that Joe could be the big one for a change so that Joe could sense in the grown man beneath him all the power his body would one day contain. His father had done his best for him. He could see that, but it hadn't made much difference. Because how much bigger was he now? And how much better if he could stand there as long as he had touching the cow, the one he supposedly sought, the one that meant it was time to go to Cindy and already know that Cindy had been right, that he was scared and he wasn't going to marry her because he barely knew her and he'd rather be wild because the main thing his body contained and would no doubt contain for the rest of his life was nothing but an urgent and genetic need to punish his child, to be like his father, to be like his brothers, to ruin the good things, to run. Thanks. Thank you, Catherine. I'll, I'll clap for all of us. Thank you. <laughs> I'll get my, I should have brought my cats and my dog in the room so we could all clap. Thank you. But, um, thank you for that. Um, and what I'll, I'll say a, a couple of things. So, you know, I've, I've read the book and uh, as it goes with reading the books, uh, you, you, you end with the end and then the beginning, you know, it seems far away, but now hearing the beginning again, I'm realizing like, okay, this is now a book I have to read another time. Because, <laughs> uh, not because I, I, it's not because I didn't get it. Don't worry. I think I got it. But <laughs> what I'm seeing and thinking about in, as you read that first chapter is I'm just thinking about how so much that's in there comes through, especially towards the end of the book. And I won't give anything away. Not that it's really this, a spoiler type of, of book, but, um, that it's just, uh, I like it even more now. I think that's what I have to say. <laughs> um, so that's, that's my thought for the, for the moment. Um, I guess an, the next question I'll ask, and I should mention folks who are watching as, as people have already started to do, uh, please write your own questions in our YouTube chat and they will be, uh, handily delivered to me and I'm in, we're in Zoom and you're in YouTube. These are things we use these days. Um, but yeah, please uh, enter your questions in there and we will get to as many as we can uh, and that'll be great. And I'll kind of uh, do damage control in the meantime. But uh, so as we've established, uh, it's a multi-perspective book. We start with Joe, it's, it's multi-perspective and um, chronological. So we start in 1971 um, and we actually end, uh, and you mentioned this, so I don't feel like I'm giving too much away, but we actually end, this book ends in the future, guys. <laughs> um, it ends in, in the year 2030, and I'll let Catherine decide how much we should say about that. But um, and then we go, you know, obviously not year by year, but you know, every few years we get a different character um, and Mitch comes back 
you know, at various points. And a couple of times there are these really cool, like single page interludes anyway. Um, and as, as Catherine has already said, she started writing um, with that perspective. We get, you know, a little more than halfway through the book, uh, that character, Alyssa, Mitch's daughter. Um, all of that said, Catherine, I'm wondering, while it makes plenty of sense that you needed to start by writing through Alyssa, um, and I would imagine a lot of fiction writers do this sort of thing where they literally put themselves in the heads of different characters in order to really start to understand them and understand how they're relating to each other. Did you always picture that that would be the book's final form, this multi-perspective um, mm -hmm. approach? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I probably could have been persuaded to, you know, just write a single first person narrative of, of a football player or thir close third um, without all those shifts. But I was so interested in the people around him. And a lot of the sort of argument of the book, if there is one, um, there are many, I guess, but one of them I think is um, sort of a exploration of the ways in which our life is not our ours, right? We don't, we don't own it entirely. It is, it belongs to the people who, um, who bring us into this world and who, um, and who we bring into the world as much as it belongs to us. And it belongs to those, those who, sort of, who accompany us on the journey, right? You know, coworkers and comrades and, um, and, um, and teammates basically. Um, and so the multi-perspective um, approach uh, really reinforced that idea and allowed me to play with, um, with that, that, that question um, in really interesting ways. And, and so the perspectives are all either parents or children or siblings, basically, you know, found siblings, teammates. Um, there are, um, or, or people who sort of identify in some way um, with the life of the protagonist. Um, I, I avoided uh, bosses and owners unless they were also family. Um, and, but, but those perspectives are definitely embedded within the, within the narrative too, because they're so important in terms of um, that question of, you know, is your life your own um, and who does it belong to? So certainly an owner <laughs> would have, might have something to say about that. So, yeah. Absolutely. Um, that, that's super interesting. And it's funny too, because so my, um, I guess you could say training as a writer is in um, narrative nonfiction, mostly memoir and personal essay. That's primarily what I teach uh, and what I've written that's, pretty much entirely what I've written. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because whenever I uh, treat myself to a novel, I read it like a memoirist for better or worse. And so when you said earlier, um, you think of this, this piece as a, as a life narrative, I was um, a bit relieved because <laughs> that's how I read it. But I also um, didn't, didn't want to insert my own you know kind of thoughts about about how we approach stories and even when you said with Alyssa you know you needed to to start this project by writing through someone you identified with a bit more and I th if I may I think I see that with a couple of the characters in yeah, the book totally, totally. yeah Alyssa yeah, and, yeah, no, I'd love to hear yeah um, let me tell you what I think yeah. Alyssa and um and Mitch's uh, first wife, maybe Karen. Um, and uh, then of course at the end, Sarah, yeah. that was the part with Cambridge. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, the women, I mean, I definitely felt, I mean, with every character I write, I, I feel like I am them, you know, for the portion of um, uh, where I'm deep, where I'm deeply working on, on, on creating th that section. Um, so, you know, even I, I, Mitch also, and, you know, and D'Antonio, his teammate, um, who gets a chapter and Joe and Tim, his uncle. So there are, um, I, you know, I, I have to kind of perform all of them in order to write them. Um, but yeah, the, I think the women, um, who are really, really important in this, in this story, there's so much of this novel is about that kind of like, it's a lot about labor generally, but it's a lot about the labor of caregiving um, that's that's behind the scenes and not, you know, we don't watch that on Sundays at one o'clock, um, but it's absolutely necessary in order to um, to get those games that that sports fans like you and me are, are so happy for. So um, yeah, the women were, the women came, came quite readily to me, I would say um, in that, in that respect. Absolutely. And it comes, it comes through and, um, 
you know, as, as usual, women are anchoring the story and the whole situation, what is <laughs> <up>, right? <Yeah. laughs> exactly. But um, kind of, so going off of that, actually, I'm gonna, I see that uh, Jayla, who's watching, hi, Jayla, uh, asked a question. And that question is, uh, what does it feel like to write about a character or identity so different from your own? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for me, that was really, thank you for that question, Jayla. That's, I love that. Um, that was so thrilling about this project um, that I somehow found the confidence uh, in, when I was beginning it to say, here I am, this extremely unathletic, you know, nerdy um, sports fan, huge sports fan. Here I am, I'm gonna just dive headfirst into like one of the most like aggressive masculine corners of our culture um, that's at once very public and also um, uh, keeps uh, strong borders around itself. Um, and so I was, I was like delighted to imagine kind of imagine the inner life and the ex experience, both physical and spiritual and emotional of a, um, a man whose job it is to, um, to knock people down. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so it was like, totally different from my experience and that made it challenging and thrilling. I found the challenge exciting, but it also, I'm someone who loves to find weird commonalities. And so I saw a lot of parallels in his life um, to in, with mine or with an artist's life even, um, or with the life of um, someone who has anyone who has any kind of ambition within a system um, that has rules that precede that person, right? Um, anyone trying to navigate a, an employment situation um, or, a, um, an industry. And so um, I was excited when I realized that those commonalities were, um, were there for me to, to play with. Um, and yeah, I think it also, you know, um, it was an exercise in empathy too, and trying to understand um, what it might be like to be a man, which, you know, we're mostly over that. We don't really care anymore what men, <laughs> what, what, what it's like to be a man. Um, but um, but I think we maybe haven't always looked at it in this way. And so I, I chose to bring this, this sort of, yeah, feminized ones to it, feminist ones to it. I will, I will allow for that kind of empathy towards men. Uh, for, for, <laughs> yes, I think that is, that makes sense. And also the kind of empathy towards a professional athlete or towards a celebrity or towards someone with wealth. You know, I think yeah. all of those things are, Thank are you. worth, yeah. worth thinking about. I agree. Um, I'm wondering, I'm wondering, given this, that you were, you know, as you, as you continued with the novel and continued into um, your exploration of, of Mitch, uh, obviously you had to get beyond yourself and your own experience. Uh, so I'm wondering about your research um, and, you know, whether that mean like research can mean a lot of different things um, when writing and, um, also, I know you're a football fan, as you have mentioned. So I'm also wondering where that factors into this. I assume it does somehow. Yeah, we just actually had a great conversation about this in my um, home program that I teach at, um, at Adelphi University. I teach in the MFA program there. And we've had, we had a whole round table about research. And this, the way you phrased the question actually was really similar to how we were approaching it um, in our conversation. And, and um, yeah, on the one hand, I, you know, I grew up reading novels that were very, you know, female centered, um, often domestic um, centered. And football was this thing I did with my family as a pastime, you know, like we watched for entertainment, but it was like, those worlds were totally separate, football and fiction. Like I wrote a certain kind of fiction, I read a certain kind of fiction and I enjoyed watching football with um, my parents. And then later with my boyfriend, who's now my husband um, and friends. And so I just didn't, it just didn't even occur to me to combine those two things. But at some point, again, it's about confidence, I think, I realized, oh, like things I'm interested in in my life could be useful and actually uh, generative and also um, intriguing to write fiction about. And so there was a, a really kind of exciting moment when I realized my wasted Sundays no longer were wasted. They were actually um, research trips, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> like 1 p.m. at a sports bar is no longer like this really self-indulgent thing. It's um, it's a it's part of my project. You know, it's very important, very important <laughs> that yeah. we're all doing. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, so there's some construction happening on the building, so we're getting okay. shadows. Um, so that's yeah, that was one part of the research. Just watching a lot of football and thinking about um, the the people doing the work on the field as I was watching them. 
Um, but also I had to do, I had to get access to spaces and places. And um, it helped that I had already written one novel because then I felt like I had a credential that I could flash, you know, to ask people to admit me to their um, spaces or to, um, or to talk to me about their lives. So I did some interviews with some former players. I got a tour of uh, the Ravens facility in Owings Mills, Maryland um, through a random string of connections. I tried Philly, I tried DC, um, but the Ravens were the ones who came through. So um, thank you to them. Uh, they were really, really helpful. Um, they shared, and they shared a lot with me just in terms of, um, you know, information about the, the daily life of a player during the season um, and showed me every space except the locker room, um, which is, is a private space for players. So I couldn't go there, but everything else I saw. Um, I also visited a research lab, which comes up later in the book. Um, and I read a ton of books. I mean, I read a lot of memoirs. I read um, various works of cultural history that were relevant to um, cultural, political, and social history that were relevant to the period and the occupations of the people in the book, even the minor ones. Um, so, you know, it was a mix of reading, talking, and touring. Um, and then also revisiting some places in my own life that ended up serving as settings for the book. So since I was writing about something so different from my own experience, it helped me to root um, the M Mitch's family life in uh, ge geographies that I knew really well. So I grew up partly in Southern, in Central Virginia in a town that I fictionalized for this novel. Um, it's called Amherst, but Monacan is uh, the town in the novel. And um, I went to high school in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, so we get some DC Bethesda stuff. I lived in Philly for six years. Mitch ends up on the Eagles uh, and also the Patriots, which I lived in, in Cambridge for a year. So we get, um, it, it, was, it was easier for me to not have to research those things, not to send them to Tampa or you know Green Bay and then be like, oh my God, I have to know all about Wisconsin, which I don't know anything about, so. Helps well, limit the research that way. <laughs> and why would we ever send our protagonist to Tampa Bay? I know. <laughs> Seriously. Only <laughs> um, if your protagonist wants to live forever and play forever and taunt. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, well, uh, I'm, I'm shocked I made it 36 minutes into the program. But uh, yeah, so I'm a Patriots fan. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and actually what you were saying initially with that answer, thank you for all of that. Mm -hmm. um, I was relating to a lot, um, not that I've I, I've, I wrote a kind of short, funny essay once, uh, I thought it was funny, about football fandom yeah. uh, for an event at the writer's house actually, but um, the way you came to thinking about writing about football is very similar to how I came to proposing a class called sports narratives yeah. right. <laughs> uh, in our creative writing program. And it, it basically came down to um, spending a bunch of time on often on Sundays um, and occasionally spilling over reading about things on Monday mornings and I've for a long time taught on Monday afternoons and um, what I what occurred to me at some point is why is the thing I'm always using as as downtime or as relaxation or as procrastination when I'm supposed to be prepping for my class like what if you took there's so many interesting stories and ways of writing about this, th about these sports. And I think it probably was initially football for me that got me thinking about this. And then it was like, you said, you know, what if I made a novel out of this? And I said, what if I made a yeah. class out of this? And, and it actually really started to um, come together uh, in 2018, which was of course the year, the year that the Eagles won the, the yeah. Super Bowl. Uh, and they beat a team that I tend to root for. And that was uh, complex to, see, uh, <laughs> to, to be here in Philly, but also just getting to be a somewhat outside observer to a city that cares passionately about its team to, to say the very least about it, uh, to watch that th those fans win a championship and to kind of read all the stuff and see all the stuff and maybe avoid a little bit of it when yeah. I, read it. yeah. but that was kind of the way that this, this class came to be. So, That's so cool. Yeah, no, it's funny. The Eagles tyrannized over me in my time in Philly also because I'm a Washington football fan. Um, and so we always had to, you know, we had to go to sports bars because we were never on TV unless we were playing the Eagles, right? Um, but I, I, I think what you're saying is, is true. There's so, it seems like these are two separate worlds. 
and that they should have they should have nothing to do with each other. But in fact, there's so much interesting overlap in terms of you know every every game has a narrative. Um, there are narratives of seasons. Um, uh, there are stories that athletes tell themselves to get themselves through um, you know difficult periods in their careers. And so, nar narrative, generally speaking, if you're if you're a novelist who's interested in it, as I am, um, is a is such a it's just such an exciting way um, to to think about um, to think about storytelling, both for for the the novel that I ended up writing, um, and yeah, and the subject itself, which is so heavily narrativized already in our culture. And I was sort of writing with and against that. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm wondering a bit about the title, and uh, I know we had uh, I think one question that that kind of concerns this a little bit. Um, so the book is called A Short Move. And, um, you know, ever the, the diligent reader, it comes up a couple of <laughs> times in the, in the book itself. So of course, every time I'm, oh, there it is. There I is. pay extra close attention right now. Um, and it, it comes up a bunch of times. Uh, you know, I think maybe the first time I noticed it, I, I can't confirm this is the exact first time was they're talking about a short move as in, you know, if we have to move away to X city, it wouldn't be that far away. They're talking about Mitch getting, getting drafted, I think. Um, and then this idea of, a sh there's this concept that maybe is the most overarching in the book, at least the way I saw it, a short move as a metaphor for, for life, meaning uh, I believe it's, it's Mitch's um, buddy who says uh, womb to tomb, right? Yeah. Uh, and then we get this idea of a short move towards the end of the book as a, as a race or as a, you know, there, there's this uh, father son thing going on. Um, I'm wondering, did you start with the, did it, I'm asking like kind of chicken or egg sort of thing, yeah. was it short move? And then you figured out where to drop it in or did it come up? And then you said, Hey, there's my title. Yeah, I think I had, I think I had the title, it's hard to remember because there were so many, you know, the, the book went through many revisions and it, um, there was a long gestation period too, um, you know, a couple of years, but I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure I heard the phrase, um, which was, so my, my husband had gone to a talk at Princeton by Cornell West. And I don't even know what the context was, but he said something about, it's a short womb from your mama's womb to your final tomb. And this is like a Cornell quote. And, and, I, and I couldn't find it anywhere. Like it wasn't like something from his writings. It was something he said um, in uh, just to this audience. And that chimed so much with the story that I was already telling this, because I, I knew I was doing a cradle to grave story. And that, so I called it cradle to grave. And then I heard womb to tomb from, from Cornell West. And, um, and I, th I think I think if I remember the story right, uh, he was talking to a, a group of undergraduates. You know, like what are you going to do with that with that short move that you have your life, right? What are you going to do with it? Um, and that was like you know like a kind of commencement day type challenge. But I was really um, struck by that the, the fact that short was was the emphasis and that move was the action. You know that life is an event. Life is is a series of actions, um, not something that just happens to you. And, um, and it felt right for football, which is a game of short moves, you know, like 10 yards at a time, sometimes one yard at a time, um, you know, little cuts. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and so I, I, there were just many ways in which that felt right. And then once I had the phrase, it was, um, it was fun to put it in the mouth of many different characters, you know, most, mostly two of the mothers. So Mitch's mother and Dee's mother both, both use the phrase. Um, and not and neither of them knowing that the other has ever said it, um, and neither of their sons necessarily realizing that the other um, had that had that image in mind. Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, kind of a somewhat related question from Sam, who is watching. Hi, Sam. Thanks for watching and asking a question. Um, that question is uh, referring back to the the chapter you just read, the first chapter, what made you title it chapter one? Because to me, it reads more like a prologue since it yeah. takes place literally before the main character's birth. So somewhat of a, this is me editorializing, but yeah. um, kind of a technicality, but also I think it does, I mean, obviously it situates us, it frames us, so yeah. Yeah, it's true, it could have been a prologue. Um, and in some ways I might've thought of it that way um, in the crafting of the book. 
but this is just like a like a dorky um novelist thing um uh I there's a lot of things I did just purely for my own pleasure when writing this book which you know may have been poor decisions uh in terms of um thinking about how to market it or whatever but I you know, I made it, so I got to construct it the way I wanted to. And there are 12 chapters. Um, you may recall there are 11 uh, players on a side in football and the offense and on the defense. And the 12th man is the fans, right? Is a kind of um, a phrase that we hear a lot in, in football. The 12th man would be the fans on the defense. Uh, our, my main character plays on the defense. Uh, so I have 12 chapters for 12, like kind of like a, a team of 12. And um, I wouldn't have gotten to have those numbers there, one through 12, if I had called chapter one a prologue. So that is truly why. <laughs> I think that is, that is a great reason. Um, really, yeah, really interesting. And I love that the form is is following that that frame of, of the football team. That's really smart. Um, yeah, really cool. Um, several positions, obviously. <laughs> but, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we didn't talk about this beforehand, so I'm gonna let you kind of decide how much we talk about it now, but um, I'm also thinking about the last chapter in the book and the, the character who comes in there. And I mentioned earlier um, that this last chapter takes place in the year 2030, the future. Um, what should we say about that? That doesn't, I don't want it to ruin yeah. an ex the experience of anybody. Yeah, I don't know what to say. I mean, I can say that chapter is the fan's perspective. So the 12th man, fan, a fan. Um, and it's also the only chapter um, that's in the first person. Yes. And so this, we have that detached omniscient third that goes deep into each um, protagonist's mind, each sort of you know central character's mind, but then um, a pretty abrupt shift. So you could imagine the novel ends at chapter 11. That could be the end. Um, and I wrote it such that you, one might think they've reached the end when they got to chapter 11. And then there's like, oh, there's this coda, epilogue, maybe. Um, and, but I, I, I thought, um, I would just say contending with the afterlife um, um, of my protagonist and his career um, was really important. I knew from the beginning of writing this, this novel about Mitch that it would um, outlive him. Hmm. That's great. I love that. Um, I also, I couldn't help but think about, like I said before, the, the character we get in the, that last chapter about her as a parallel to, to you as the reader in terms of just, I don't know, uh, I'll say this somewhat tongue in cheek in terms of her getting in Mitch's head. <laughs> um, totally. Yeah. <laughs> People, people who don't know what we're talking about you got to get this book. oh that's great yeah, that's, yeah i don't think anyone's phrased it exactly like that before but yes i like it i i uh have it written in all caps on my notes she's literally in his head uh, <laughs> you know. thank you yeah yeah i must have thought of that at some point you're, but you're totally right that's great yeah she's a you know she she's a fan she's she has a social a uh, profile that's similar to mine, um, you know, um, the only child of two older parents uh, who spent a, a great portion of her childhood in the South, kind of fish out of water there, and then, you know, has a more academic life um, rather than, you know, more a more cerebral life rather than a more um, uh, physical and, you know, embodied um, labor experience. And so, um, yeah, again, another, 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 perspective it was quite easy for me to inhabit and also fun to play with what that meant for the creation of Mitch yeah by someone like me yeah right and that chapter really does get I mean it gets away from so much else in the story you know and it's such a um an interesting and unique uh move on your part to to take us to such a to like a different world essentially in the last chapter like sometimes I like to think oh well what would a with all due respect to writing workshops, because I love a writing workshop and I will lead one in a little over an hour. But, um, <laughs> you know, sometimes it's fun to think like, what would, what would everybody say in a writing workshop? And you could 
I, I could hear people in a, in a writing workshop say, well, that last chapter just doesn't, it's, that's a different story or something. Yeah. But I think that in a lot of ways is kind of the point. And it's also a different story, but it's, it's the same story. And as I said, after you read your, um, your excerpt, there's so much that kind of comes somewhat full circle there, even in terms of the, um, the imagery, you're, you know, um, I see a kind of question slash comment from from David and I hi David uh, David works with me David's actually an Eagles fan and we had an issue during that whole situation oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but David said you know from the first chapter I, I really love the detail of Joe mapping cow formations and reacting appropriately if this cow does this I'll do that and then David kind of question comments reactive footballer brain uh, yeah. and we get some of that at towards the end too yeah yeah totally um, yeah, that was, it was very fun to think about how, um, th throughout the book, thinking about the various football players and their, um, and their reactions to, um, to space, <laughs> like how they negotiate space with other bodies, um, in it. That was a fun theme and, um, and kind of motif for me to, to, to play out throughout. And yeah, cows, cows are just really important in the book too. Um, cows as, as, a uh, as a fixtures of the landscape in Virginia, um, and as um, and as figures of kind of repose, but also um, of you know of work, right? They're they're out there working for us, making milk for us, um, you know, herded herded by us. So there's a there's a way in which the cows are are women. There's a way in which the cows are football players. There's a way you know yeah. the whole thing. Absolutely. Um, I'll just put out another call to our to our listeners. If people have uh, questions, throw those in the YouTube chat for us, and we will get to them. Um, so you mentioned, I think, very at the very start of this conversation, um, one of the things that really intrigued you about Mitch's character was this idea of him being, you know, as as many athletes are, specifically professional athletes. Um, uh, with the exception, perhaps, of that one we know who plays in Tampa Bay now, uh, <laughs> when they're in their late 30s, they're kind of coming to the end of it. They're sort of premature old people, in a sense. Um, and I was I was thinking about this as I was reading, especially as you get further into the into the book. And um, one of the connections I was making that I thought I was making simply because of what is going on in my own uh almost entirely at home life right now is, um, so I'm, I am two episodes away from the end of The Sopranos. Whoa. I know, <laughs> I, I'm, glad, I'm glad we're all here today to support me. <laughs> oh my <laughs> God. I was like writing in my notes and thinking in my head, I'm like, there is some big Tony Soprano energy here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. Um, totally. Um, and, at first, I just, like I said, I just thought like, well, that's probably just because I just watched a couple of episodes last night and I'm reading these really fabulous recaps online and, and you know, getting ready, preparing myself for the end, but end of the show, but also the, the, the big Tony Soprano energy, first of all, comes with this idea. Similarly, Tony's in like his early forties, but he seems a lot older and he's sort of in this twilight that feels premature. And maybe that is partly having to do with me being in my almost well, my late thirties, uh, I'll say it, my late thirties. And, uh, <laughs> but, but then we get to this part where uh, Mitch uh, actually refers to the Sopranos. Right. <laughs> and I like freaked that's out. Great. Oh, that's uh, great. Yeah, I was watching, I did watch that show while I was writing. Um, I mean, I wrote this book over the course of seven years. So a lot of things came and went, but, um, but I definitely watched the Sopranos during, um, right, maybe, maybe at the beginning or right before I started writing. Um, or maybe I, it's hard to, no, I think I finished it. I finished it when I lived in New Jersey, which was so appropriate um, oh, sure. and while I was writing the, the early stages of writing the book. So it's not a coincidence um, that you get some Tony energy. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I was, I was thinking about ways in which, you know, Mitch is this kind of patriarch um, figure um, in and in a, yeah, some similar ways to that Tony is. Yeah, for sure. Um, all well, right. They're probably pretty similar, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, ultimately, maybe uh, 
Mitch isn't quite as, as uh, faded as Tony, although I have two episodes left. I assume they're just going to wrap everything up and it'll all be fine in those last yeah. episodes. Yeah, no problem. So, yeah. Yeah. Happily ever after, technically. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. But um, all right, we have another question from David. Uh, a fan perspective at the end. Whoa, uh, regarding changing cool. perspectives. How did you decide which characters the reader would follow? How did you just? How did you know that this character needed a chapter? Thank nice yeah, question. thanks, David. Um, you know, for me, I think probably part of it is the you know, my um, formation as a novelist was definitely through the, you know, through domestic fiction and um, multi-generational family stories. Like that is a thing I gravitated towards again and again. So whenever I think about a character, I can't help but think about their parents, their partners, their children. Um, it's just like where I go when I'm like figuring out who this person is, like who raised them? Like, you know, who did they give birth to and raise? And like, who did they choose to, you know, create a life with or not create a life with, you know, um, romantically. So, um, so by the time I got through all those really important relationships, there was like, you know, hundreds of pages. Um, so it, it, it's true that this could have been a book that was entirely centered on a team, you know, or a franchise that was entirely a workplace novel. Um, but that, but I, but I was just so into his mom and his absent father and his first wife and many other, you know, like there were just too many people already before I got to um, the workplace. Um, and so the, um, the characters that ended up being most important in this book, yeah, were, fam were family-based relationships. Um, I, for me, that was cool because it was thinking about, um, I, I, it, it, made, it meant that it was a novel that was about work, but work as lived through a family as opposed to um, work where family's in the background. I love that. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I'll just move right on to another question uh, from Mingo. Hi, Mingo. Mingo's my pal. Mingo's also an Eagles fan. I know all these people. Um, Man, Philadelphia, what can you do? Yeah, what's okay. crazy is that I hate the Eagles and the Patriots, and I've made my main character, who I apparently like, play for both of those teams. So, you know. I you guys are <laughs> I know how you feel about the Patriots because I'm sh this has come up in yeah. conversation before yeah. um and I was shocked when <laughs> he went to the pay I was like wow and I had a f I was I think before I got there I had just in you know flipping through the book I had seen in all caps the the phrase do your job and I was like oh, is, yeah. he doing, is he gonna oh my goodness uh, so that was that was thrilling for me um, I'm wearing my most generic Patriot yes. shirt today. This, uh, this features Julian Edelman, who might be playing quarterback for the Patriots in a very <laughs> ill-advised game tonight. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, anyway, and, Mingo's question, sorry. Mingo has a question. Yes. <laughs> uh, I would interrupt Mingo's question by talking about the Patriots, but uh, Mingo asks, I'm always curious about process. How much do you write every day and what is your process uh, and what are you working on now? Great question. Thank you, Mingo. Yeah, I'm always curious about process too. Um, and it took me a long time to accept what mine is. Now, now I teach and so I'm always asking my students this question and, um, and getting them to articulate what their process is because I think that's probably the best way to create one is to notice what you do, like notice what um, conditions produce work and also create um, a sense of well-being because I think that's really important to maintain um, when embarking on long projects, long artistic projects. Um, and so and so I, lo I love talking about this. And it just turns out mine is it's very intuitive. Um, you know, I've read a lot of interviews with writers and I like I used to love to ask writers about their process to like see if I could learn tricks from them too. And I do I have picked up things here and there from others. Um, certainly when I was in grad school, I wrote every day and I tell my students they should write every day. Um, because I think that you, it's like, you know, when you want to develop a really, um, serious habit, you do have to repeat it again and again and again until it feels automatic. Another thing that I can, um, relate to, um, athletes about, right. You have to do, you have to do these, um, you have to practice, practice, practice. People often talk about writing as a muscle. Right, absolutely. Which is absolutely. kind of lame, but I yeah. think it's true. <laughs> yeah. No, it's so true. You have to be able to sit down at the computer and just like do it the same way an athlete has to just like put on his shoes and run, right? Like you can't, you can't be wondering if like the first step is going to be a good one. <laughs> like that's just not, that's not gonna, not gonna get you there. Um, 
so yeah, so that was, that was important. I think in the beginning for me was developing that muscle, but I absolutely do not write every day now. Um, I am more of a like, um, fallow period, productive period person. Mm -hmm. So I spend, um, years working really hard on something. And then I take like months off or I spend a couple months working really hard on something. And then I take a few months off or weeks off and I'll still be picking at it. I'll definitely still be thinking about it. Um, I might be revising or like, you know, um, still messing with it in some way, but not necessarily writing new material. Right. And we talked um, about your, your research process as well. well. So you can kind of take writing breaks that where you're reading a lot or you're exactly. doing some of these conversations or visits or, you know, whatever the research is. Yeah, yeah exactly. And I think for a lot of projects, it's just you reading a lot to sort of figure out what kind of, um, what kind of work I want to create you know, formally, like what it, what it might look like, you know, as an, as a, um, as a book, um, you know, how it might map, um, what style, what styles I might be drifting towards. Um, so I definitely have, you know, at the beginning of every writing residency I go to, I like to do those. I like to spend, you know, three weeks to a month, um, in seclusion somewhere where someone is cooking for me. Um, it's just a really great thing, writers out there. You should, you should try to do those. I love the VCCA, in Virginia, which also ended up being research because it was um, the the geography there and the environment there um, is basically where Mitch grew up, um, uh, or was the model for it. Uh, so yeah, so I would often spend the first several days at a residency just reading, and then you know day four or five like dive into to the writing. Um, so yeah, I, I I do actually like to share that because I think a lot of people think if they don't write every day, they're not writers. Or if you're not working on something, or if you didn't write today, you're not allowed to tell someone you're a writer. Um, I, I just I just have to disagree with that because I, I, it's just not my way. My way has definitely been, you know, production and then respite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think, I mean, what you just said right there reminds me, and I think it might remind Mingo, uh, knowing what I know about Mingo, um, of uh, I'm a runner, Mingo's a runner. Oh. Uh, I see my my pal Sydney Schneider in the comments there, also a runner, also a Miami Dolphins fan. Uh, and I think it's the same thing. Like if, if you trained for a race last year, but you're taking a break, a lot of people are like, oh, I, I mean, I did that thing, but I'm not really, uh, and it's like, no, man, come on. Yeah. 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 Um, and then Mingo asked, uh, also, what are you working on now? Did you, oh, yeah. did you tactically avoid that? I <laughs> Probably <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have, I have a nine month old baby. So, um, and I, and I just released this book plus a, a book about, um, Elena Ferrante that was a co-written, co um, work of criticism, uh, that came out in January. So this has been just a super productive year for me in terms of like new things out in the world. And I've had to be tending to those things um, quite a lot, the book, both the books and the baby. So um, what I'm mostly working on right now, to be perfectly honest, is a diary about the baby. Um, so that is probably a private piece of writing. Um, you know, I, I think, but it's, but it's writing and it's exercise. So I'm working that muscle um, just in trying to get down um, all the things I'm noticing about her before they, before they disappear or um or trans you know transform into something new right um she has she has certain uh physical characteristics now that she won't have in a few months and um she has certain behaviors and actions that she does that she won't do um at some point so i am trying to kind of trying to get that down that's my current project <laughs> I, I have a novel idea i have a i have a i have a mess of pages that are a third novel the beginning of a third novel but i haven't been working on that well, I mean, thanks for letting us know that, first of all. And also, I mean, I think that it's so good to hear about a project, about writing that you're doing that is more personal yeah. than, say, professional. Um, and even though, for instance, Penn students uh, aren't necessarily spending time with their nine month old babies, uh, <laughs> they, I think, you know, they're go-getters, if I may. Yep. Uh, and I think it's, they sometimes, we sometimes all, um, I'm a Penn alum, so I can include myself in that, but we sometimes forget that you can be working on a personal project that yeah. 
it's a that's good. We would like yeah. you to do that, you know. Yeah. 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 I, I I too go go get her, you know, um mm -hmm. never never wanted to show weakness, you know, um, as I was emerging into this writing life, you know, like it was like until I had published a novel, could I really say I was a novelist? I don't know. Um, but my yeah, my approach to that was always just to just to kind of overly like just just claim it. Mm -hmm. um, to share that information with people who wanted to know, um, sort of to hold myself accountable, um, but also uh, um, yeah, to help me get to the finish line, um, but also to recognize that, you know, the, the effort um, and the attempt um, are enough, you know, and they really, they really should be because I, I'm not, I wasn't doing this in order to do something. Do you know what I mean? Like I was right. writing a novel in order to write a novel. So what, how, how good it is, uh, how successful it was, like what kind of career it would enable me to have, um, really, really would should have been and and was a sort of secondary concern. Mm -hmm. um, and now that I have a career, it's a lot easier to say, oh yeah, <laughs> uh, I will be perfectly candid and vulnerable with you and say I am not writing anything right now. Yeah. But I hope I hope that young um, young writers can feel that way too. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Better world if we could all actually admit the truth. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> better world. <laughs> Yes, and also in a year where you've had two books come out and you have this this little one, uh, <laughs> you you certainly have every every right and every reason to be kind of uh, doing you know working on a different level. I would say, yeah. um, and what you were just saying also, I, I can't help myself but uh, say that it reminds me of what we hear in Philadelphia. Actually, we don't hear it as much anymore. But we, we used to hear it a lot and it was with regard to basketball, not football, but that was trust the process. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and the process yeah. involves like a lot of like aimless walking and, you know, tidying up your apartment and messing up your apartment and having drinks with friends and sleeping um, and reading and dreaming. <laughs> just like, those are all part of the process. Right, and right. Reading, reading articles about your sports teams and yeah. watching games and <laughs> all of that. Exactly. Painting your house, whatever you're doing. Yeah, right. it's all process. Yes. Um, well, I have just one more question um, and this has been so wonderful, but you mentioned, uh, you mentioned that you, the other book that came out uh, this year is is about Elena Ferrante. And I also have been thinking about, and I noticed right away that uh, the epigraph yeah. in this book uh, is Elena Ferrante. And I have it right here, so I'll read it in case you don't have it right with you. But that quote is, to be alive meant to continually collide with the existence of others and to be collided with, the results being at times good-natured at others aggressive, then again, good natured. Yeah. Why that quote? Um, you know, I came across it when I was working on um, the book of criticism. And yeah, obviously I was thinking a lot about collisions uh, in a short move. And um, it was so arresting to me that that word appeared uh, in that moment. I mean, it's a, an interview she gave at some point. Um, it's in the Frontamalia, which is her uh, collection of interviews and letters um, uh, regarding her process, actually. And um, thinking about, I, I realized that the book is so much about collisions um, with other, other personalities and other selves, um, as much as the obvious physical collisions that are inherent to the game of football. And so it was really thrilling to me that um, here was Ferrante writing an, a, a world apart from American football, um, but dealing with some of the same ideas about, um, about is your life your own? You know, who do you belong to? The community, the family, um, uh, your parents, your friends. Um, and, you know, these are gir girls in Naples in, um, uh, you know, the 20th century, most of her novels, um, the, 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 the Neapolitan Quartet firmly set, um, you know, in the post-war period of the 20th and early 21st century. And, um, and then here I was with, with, um, with this man in rural America uh, and then the NFL and, and yet to have these themes be so um, in, in conversation with each other so, um, so nakedly was really, really cool. So I just had to do it. And it also, for me, helped um, stamp the fact that those books are being written at the same time, that I was working on these two projects at once. So when I'm 80 years old and looking back, 
I will have that epigraph that reminds me that I was reading, writing about Ferrante at the same time as I was writing about football, which is um, odd and interesting. I love that. I think that's <laughs> great. Um, all right. Well, thank, thank you, Catherine. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for all the wonderful questions yes. um, for, from you and from the, the whole group. I wish I could have seen all of the, uh, the questioners, but I'm grateful you guys were watching. Thank you. Yes. Uh, and thank you to the Creative Writing Program for making this happen today, um, to our Writer's House pals, Allie and Zach for handling some of the, the details and the tech. Um, and as you can see in the YouTube uh, chat, there is a very important link, which is so you can go right now and buy this book. It's right here. It's a really pretty green color. It's really wonderful. Uh, so we hope you'll do that. Uh, and the, fortunately, the link we're providing is one of the, the, the links that helps out uh, small independent bookshops. There, there are these other links on the internet where you can yeah. buy books and it's much worse. Um, so we, we yeah. do it this way. So I hope you will do that. Um, and thank so you. I will for say, if they've sold out, it's okay to use the other links. <laughs> yes. Sometimes yeah. B&Ds sell out and it's hard to get the book. And if that's the case, you are permitted to use those other shall rename nameless links on the internet to get it. I think that is excellent. <laughs> Advice. As, I mean, we're football fans, so we're we have compromised ethics. We've already, but yeah, we've been deeply. <laughs> yes, for sure. <laughs> thank, you. Um, thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Bye.